My name is David Packy Hamilton. So, although the name Packy is a nickname I got when I was a boy, but I tell people in England, Packy is Irish for Patrick. Life growing up in Belfast then, and uh, you know, you're within your family. I mean, were your family loyalists, and you know, were there religious no, or no? There was nothing like that in my family. Uh, they, they certainly weren't religious at all. You know, we went to church as children, but that was only for a year or two. But the, although I've always believed in God, and there was nothing of the troubles at that time, so uh, religion never played a part in it. When you were living in Rathcool and the conflict was going on, when did it impact on you personally? At that time it was a mixed estate, you know, both Protestant and Catholic. So a lot of my friends were Roman Catholics. I ran around with a guy called Bobby Sands who led the hunger strike in the That's Maze right. prison. And, you know, if somebody had it told me when we were 10, kicking a ball around the street, that we'd end up in jail or end up as enemies even, I would have thought, how could that ever be? You know, but it's sure enough, I was there uh, in the H blocks when the hunger strike began, and I remember seeing Bobby Sanza's photograph on television. And I thought, dear me, that's Sanza, mm. who I ran about with. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, were you aware of the conflict? I wasn't aware. I, I didn't know even when I watched it on television that it was in you know, that it was our own country. And then as it went on and as I got older, I realized it was happening all around me and that people called it the troubles, you know, the conflict between Protestant and Roman Catholics. But I understood none of that. Mm -hmm. So did you experience anything that made you kind of, uh, you know, identify that, oh, there's something wrong here, it's, it's impacting on, on uh, you know, you and Rath Cook. I did, yes. I, did. I, was, I was 14, I think, and I was walking home from school alongside the Glen River, and uh, these boys came towards me and they were wearing Catholic school uniform, and I knew one or two of them. But as they got right up to me then, one of them said to the others, I think we should beat Davy Hamilton up and throw him in the river. Nice. I thought that's bad news because I'm David Hamilton. <laughs> that's really bad news because I can't swim. <laughs> but sure enough, these guys just lit on me and started punching and kicking me and eventually they tossed me into the water. And as I was climbing out of the water, I was more in shock rather than, I don't think it was hurt that much. But I was in shock, but why did they do this? And one of them glimpsed round and then he stopped and looked again. And he said to me, you don't know why we did that? And I says, no, I don't, why? He says, I'll tell you why, it's because you're a Protestant and we are Catholics. Right. And I says, oh, he says, Protestant and Catholics fight with each other. And I thought, I wish you had told me that at the beginning, I'd have become a Catholic, you know. <laughs> Well, I thought it was too late then, you know. <laughs> but it was a turning point in my that was life. was a turning point, was it? It right? really was because yeah. I knew these guys and I thought, we no longer can be friends. Mm -hmm. And I never ever had Catholic friends from that day on. Did you feel any peer pressure to join the paramilitaries? That's a good question because uh, when people hear my story then say, did you, when you joined the paramilitaries, it wasn't something that I planned to do or anything, but I was aware of the fighting of street gangs and all between Protestant and Catholics. But then one night a man came into our youth club and he was wearing a, an army uniform and we were all looking at him. And he walked across and opened the fire exit doors and these other two men came in and they were carrying uniform. And he walked across and set them on top of the table, tennis table. We were all standing there, 15, 16 year olds. And he said, we are starting a Protestant paramilitary group to fight the IRA. Who wants to fight the IRA? Most 
people put their hand up. If you didn't, somebody dug you, then you put your hand up. Mm. But that's how I joined the UDA. It wasn't because I made a conscious decision to do it, but I just got involved. When you say peer pressure, it wasn't because nobody could make me do anything I didn't want to do, but it was peer influence. Peer influence, yeah. I seen my friends doing it. Yeah, yeah. And that was why I think I, I done it, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so I joined the UDA, but they gave me a uniform and it was only after a couple of weeks. Or, they said that we would start doing weapon training and that if I went to a house, they would teach me then how to use a gun. Right, and you were what age, 15? Uh-huh. And your parents didn't know anything about Oh, they had that. no idea, but I'll tell you what happened. It must have been a year later, and one night we were doing weapon training, and the man said to me, David, do you want to take the gun home? You can mind it and bring it back next week. And I says, OK, thank you. I thought this is great, going home with the gun. And after that, I, I used to hide the gun in, in my bedroom, but it was well hid, you know. Aye. Sometimes I couldn't even find it. <laughs> but you know, my mother found it. Did she? Oh, she did. Oh, right. I heard her screaming and I ran out in the hall, shook my head. I, I knew something. And she was down holding the gun by the trigger guard at the top of the stairs. Who does this belong to? Shouting and all. Mm. So I looked at my sister and says it must be hers. Right. She shook her head. She was about seven at the time. Right. Okay. But I, I joke about it, of course, but when my father came home from work, my mother said, he has a gun in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. And my dad just called me into the dining room and closed the door, grabbed me by the throat up against the wall. And he said, do you see if you bring a gun back into this house, you'll be wearing your teeth as a necklace. Right. That's just what he said. And I knew he was serious, you know, I never brought that gun back in. Mm -hmm. Instead, I would just walk around the back of the house and pull the dog out of the kennel, put the gun in and then shove the dog back in again. Right, okay. When the police arrested me, I told them he was a gun dog. <laughs> but the police wouldn't laugh at that. They, there's no humour. Uh -huh. But that was truly, my mother then knew that I was involved and I started to be arrested then for armed robberies or other things. So, well, you're talking a wee bit about armed robberies then. You'd obviously got involved in them in some way, did you? Of course, once you get involved in things like that, you start doing things. And uh, at the start, I was doing only minor things. I would steal cars for other men to use or would burn cars afterwards or sometimes I would carry weapon or ammunition or something, even in a school bag, right. you know. But I did, I got involved in armed robberies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What were you arrested for first? Armed robbery. Armed robbery, mm -hmm. right. I went into prison. 1973. It was called Long Cash at that time, yeah. just outside Lisburn. But they had political status in the prison, mm -hmm. so you didn't have to wear a prison uniform. But we wore a terrorist uniform of the organisation. And I learned more probably in jail than I did outside about terrorism. Right. And people find this hard to believe, you know, but we had bomb making classes and weapon training in jail. Really? And we had real guns. I kid you not. How did you get the real guns? Oh, with friendly prison officers. Right. No, okay. but they were smuggled in, of course, you know. Yeah. But I'm just saying, we did have guns. and right. There's men that have been shot dead in prison, as you know, in Northern Ireland, in the prisons. Mm -hmm. and, and it's because prisoners had access to weapons. But that's what happened in, in that time in having political status. But I was there for uh, nine months or so and then went for trial and I got, actually got released. Right. You know, I was put on like a license and all. But. What age were you there around that time? 17. You were 17. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm sure your mother and father were upset at that. Oh. Of course, because my mother 
cried when her Catholic neighbours were put out. Oh, right. So she thought, this is terrible, and then, you know, that I got involved then. Mm -hmm. I have a, a younger brother, but nobody else in my family ever was involved in it. Mm -hmm. But I seemed to be the black sheep then. Right. And when I came out of prison, I, I, I actually turned 18 in prison at that time in long cash and I got out of jail. But I was still full of hatred and all that. And I thought this is a good cause, we're fighting. I didn't see myself as a terrorist, I would have just said, I'm a Protestant Northern Ireland as part of the British, you know, British, and I don't want to be called an Irish man. And so that just starts to consume you. And the whole uh, ethos of the UDA was defence? Was defense? Ulster Defence Association. Yeah. Okay. But I have to say this, you know, because I knew nothing about Irish history. Mm -hmm. Not a thing. And I just thought North and South and the South is Republic and Catholic. The North is British and Protestant. And so I thought being a good Protestant was being loyal to the Queen. I didn't think it had anything to do with God. Yeah. I didn't. Mm -hmm. So you got out of pr prison then quite quickly that time and then did you go back into the UDA or you just no, stayed in it anyway? Or? No I didn't. Uh, I got out and I, I was full of hatred and that and because of all the things I'd learned in jail at that time I thought I'm going to join the Ulster Volunteer Force, the UVF because they were the most feared group then at that time in the province and uh, I thought they're very secretive where the UDA was not illegal but the UVF was mm -hmm. but they were more offensive and I thought rather than be defensive I'd rather be offensive and I, that was my reason then for joining the UVF. You know I'm not trying to justify my, it was wrong what I done but I had family you know, that had been blown up in mm -hmm. the Oma bombing and that, and, and had family who'd been attacked by the IRA because they were part-time soldiers. So all of that just, to me, built up, and mm -hmm. I just thought it was justified in fighting back as a war. Okay. So you got involved in the UVF then, so as you went on and it, did you get arrested after doing something in particular or? No, you know what? I was never actually caught doing anything. I robbed banks and post offices and, and everything probably at some stage I took a part in. So when I was arrested, I was questioned about murder, bank robberies, bombings, stealing weapons, all of those things, you know? Mm -hmm. And if you're in it long enough, you'll probably participate in everything but at that time I was robbing banks and post offices and things and did you get arrested for, for uh, anything in particular then, what happened was the police came to our house an early morning raid and kicked the door and pulled me out of bed and I, I was in uh, well I was taken to the interrogation center and the police then asked me all these questions but at that time I a joke about it, but you know, the policeman said to me, where were you on the 29th of September, 1977? Mm -hmm. I says, where were you on the 29th of September, 1977? He says, I was investigating a bank robbery in the Malone Road, and I think you done it. And I mean, oh, right. But that's what happened after interrogation then. I was put in Crumlin Road Jail. And a year later then I went for my trial. And had you done it? I had, yes. Yeah. You sound like a policewoman. <laughs> I had, but that's it, uh, You're, you know. Yeah, so you went for the trial. Uh... I had a list of these charges and you go through one at a time. So the first sentence he says, member of a legal organization sentence you to five years. You have anything to say and I'm shouting, yes, no surrender. And then the next charge, you robbed the bank and such and such. Uh, have you anything to say? Yes, for God and Ulster. All this stupidity, you know, when I think about it now, I shake my head. But I knew it was going down and I even wore 
my UVF uniform to trial. Now, if you're going to plead not guilty, don't dress up as a terrorist. I'm standing in the dock like Thunderbirds, you know. It was laughable, but it was. But at the end of it, adding it all, I got a total of 28 years. And he said I would spend 12 to 15 years in jail. How did you feel? This is what happens, you relive it. Mm. Okay. No, it was harder for my mum. Yeah. She was at the at the trial and all. She watched how I was reacting and every time the judge said, if you anything to say, and I'm shouting all this nonsense, she came down into the cells and I was still handcuffed and she was crying like, and she said, I don't know what's going to happen to you. You're just throwing your life away, she said. You have a wife and a baby son and you're shouting and you're going to jail now. You could be in jail for 15 years. And she says, this will be the death of me. And I says, Ma, I'm a loyalist. Well, that made her worse. She said, it's your mother you're talking to, not your friends. I don't want to hear none of this nonsense. I'm worried about you. So I'm standing there handcuffed like this, and I just thought, I'm not listening to this. I said to the screw you, the prison officer, put her out, you know. And she walked over to the grill, and I, I knew he was turning. The, and I looked over at her, and in here she says, you're a hopeless case, David. You'll never change. And I was right like this to myself. I was just <laughs> glad to see her go. But of course, you know, I was still handcuffed at, and, and the officer came over and he just shook his head. And But they were, all my friends were there handcuffed and all their parents and all. Everybody was upset, you know what I mean, by it all. But you know what was funny? That night when I was lying in my cell, this is what happened to me in the prison. That very night, they don't let you go into the wing. You're, you're in a, a cell when you first come into the jail. And I'm lying on the bed and I looked up at the ceiling and this is true. A guy had burned his name with his cigarette lighter, you know, with the flame, onto the paint like that. And when I looked up and read it, and I got the shock of my life, this was a prisoner who had been murdered just a month before in, in the prison, in the prison right. when I was there. And I was there when he was murdered and I looked and seen his name and I thought, my goodness. And I thought, well, at least I'm still living, mm. you know. But I thought I'll probably have to do 12 or 15 years. So you can't see the light. At yeah. the end. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. You just think this is it, you know. So what kept you going at any level? Was it was the UGA that you there were a group of you there? Did, did you support each other? Or? Of course, yeah. there's all that whole camaraderie, and even with that, you know, it's interesting. But you see, because you're all in jail, uh, when we were rioting in the prison, all the IRA men were shouting our support and all, don't give in to them Brits and all, and. You know, there was a whole thing because everybody's prisoners at the end of the day. So there was that camaraderie between the, the IRA and, and yourself? Yes, but there was animosity, of yeah. course. Uh, if you went to the shower and you were the only Protestant, you were getting beat up mm. in the shower room. So there was always fighting and things going on. Mm. But when we were fighting the police or prison officers... They were on your side? They were always, yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So but you were very young as well, weren't you? I was, yes. But I have to tell you this, because my mother, on the way home from court after my trial, called in to see her brother. And his, my uncle's wife and her mother were there. And my mother was still crying and all. And she said, David's went back to jail. He's a hopeless case. I told him he's a hopeless case. And here she is to them. Prison won't change him. 
I figured out tomorrow he'd go straight back and join the poor militaries. That's all he lives for. And this old woman in her 80s, here she is, Miss Hamilton. I believe God can change your son. And she says, I am going to pray for him. Wow. And my mother just shook her head and she nodded at her head. So I tell people, it's not my fault I'm a Christian. That old woman's to blame. Right. She put me on her wanted list. <laughs> but you're glad of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was in jail about two and a half years when I had an experience of God that turned my life around completely. Okay. Yes. And it wasn't, you know, after I get converted, people said to me, oh, were you going to church or were you talking to somebody? Were you reading the Bible or something? I says, no, I wasn't. I was doing none of those things. I walked into my cell, the same as any other night, carrying a cup of tea, and you lock up at half seven. I came into my cell, and there was a bit of paper lying on my bed, just a wee small, and I thought, what's that? So I picked it up like this and turned it around, and I laughed. It said, Jesus Christ is coming back soon. And my cellmate was there, so I said to him, you're listening, Jesus Christ is coming back soon. And then I said to a cinema near you. <laughs> okay. So he roared and laughed, you see. And we were just laughing. And I r rolled it up like this, look, and went over and threw it out the window. And I'm sitting on my bed just drinking my cup of tea. And I, I forgot about the track, I think I had anyway. And I was sitting there. And it was as suddenly as that, a voice said to me, it's time to change, become a Christian. And I thought, <laughs> I choked on the tea, I thought to myself, become a Christian? I went to church when I was younger and it was a nightmare. And the minister dressed up like Batman with big robes and all on. And, uh, I used to look round at all their happy, smiling faces. They're all big, long faces like a horse. And you could tell who were the Christians. They looked miserable. And I thought, I wouldn't want to be a Christian. There's more life in a pencil battery than there is these Christians. But the thought was in my head, you know, become a Christian. And I thought, become a Christian? Where did that come from? And then I walked over to the big shelf and I set my cup up. And in jail, you're allowed, every prisoner can have six books. And one of the books that you keep is always the Bible. Because if you've no cigarette papers, you can just rip a page from the Bible. So I smoked Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. I did I always lived a rip a page and it was a real holy smoker, you know. So I left the Bible down and was looking at it and then I put it back up again. But I walked back over in my bed and I was sitting there and I looked over again at the Bible. So I got up and walked over again. Do you know what? Three times I did that. And I thought, why why am I going to the Bible? And of course my cellmate, I should tell you this first. Everybody in jail has a nickname, so I told you my nickname was Packy. My cellmate, his nickname was Bungalow. Right. He had no upstairs, you right. see, so that's why they called him Bungalow. And Bungalow said to me, I'm getting dizzy watching you with that Bible. And I said to him, I'm thinking about being a Christian. Well, he, he laughed. He lay on top of his bed like a dead chicken. He had his legs up there, holding his sides, laughing. Mm -hmm. Ha! Christian! He says, go to sleep, you'll be okay tomorrow. There's air getting in. <laughs> and of course he laughed. But you see, I thought, well, he's right, you know what I mean? Why am I thinking like this? This is crazy. And I sat down on the bed, and then it happened again. God spoke to me again, and he says, David. And everybody would call me by my nickname, but God, I heard David. It's time to change, become a Christian. And then it was this, David, it's God that has kept you alive. Right. And I thought, it wasn't God kept me alive. I, I, I've been lucky. 
And I'm sitting there, you know, and the Bible says in Galatians 1, Paul the Apostle says, No man taught me the gospel, neither did I receive it from any man. But when God chose to reveal his Son to me, that's what he says, he revealed Jesus to him. And then he says a couple of verses down, and even in the next chapter, he says again, I went to Jerusalem by revelation. And you know what? God gave me revelation. Mm -hmm. Information doesn't change people, but revelation does. Mm -hmm. And God gave me revelation. And you know what it was too? I thought, no, it's just been lucky. And then I started to remember things that had happened to me. And I've never done this ever. But you know, I was sent out one time to put a bomb in a building and I planted this bomb and I thought of enough time to climb over the wall and drive away. I was still inside the place when the bomb exploded, blew me up too. And I woke up, building was ablaze and I jumped up and shook my head I guess and glass fell out of my hair and I looked and my clothes were cut to shreds. And I thought, no, I'll be cut to pieces. And I looked, and you know what? There was not a scratch, not one scratch on me. And I remember thinking, why am I not bleeding? But I didn't think, oh, that was God. But that night I'm thinking, was that God? No, why would, I'm thinking, no, why would God do that? But God showed me this, that I could have died then. And I thought, Maybe that was God. And then I thought another time I was in a Chinese restaurant and I was sitting with my girlfriend and the door kicked open and I looked up and it was two IRA men. I recognised one of them. But they both pulled out a gun each and, and the guy then says, Packy Hummel, you're coming with us. And I thought, if I go with these men, they're, they're going to cut me to pieces because my arms were covered and political tattoos for God and Ulster, kill all Irish men, remember 1690, loyalist prisoner war, they would have had a field day. And I thought, no, they'll torture me. And then I looked across and there was a fire exit door and I thought, run for the door. And I jumped up and I ran over and there was a bar across the door. But here's what happened. I went against the bang the door open and then I stopped and I put my hands up. And then I turned and I ran up the room and went through the kitchen doors, but they were up there. But I did that, ran out the door and it brought me through the kitchen and I was able to jump up onto the railway lines and run away. And I heard siring, so I knew it was safe to go back to see my girl, I was concerned about her. I walked back into the restaurant again, the police and army are there. And one of the customers said it was him they were chasing. And the policeman turns to me and here he is, how did you know? And here's me, what? No, what? He says, how did you know not to go through the fire exit door? And I says, why? He said, there was three gunmen. Them two weren't going to shoot me, but he was waiting on me. Mm-hmm. And what could I, I just says, right, no, too smart for them. And, mm -hmm. But you see, that night sitting in jail, I said to myself, was that God too then? Yeah. Was it God stopping me at the door? And then I thought, no, nah, sure, God only loves good people. Right. But why would God be interested in me? And I thought, that doesn't make sense, you know. Probably my worst experience. I was walking up a street and a guy came running up and I looked over and I seen him and he, he just pulled out a gun. But the thing was, he didn't, he just ran right over to me and he pushed the gun up to me. So I grabbed his arm and pulled it down and he shot me then three times and I fell on the ground. And when I was lying on the ground, he leaned over and he put the gun down to my head. And when he pulled the trigger, I watched him pull the trigger and the gun jammed. 
and he cursed me and he ran off. And I'm there in my cell. And I says, so I must have been God then, kept me alive. But I thought, and this is to me the biggest thing about conversion. Do you know what? I didn't want my life changed. But you see then, at that very moment, I thought, oh God, please, take away all this hatred and bitterness and all. I says, God, if you change me, I says, I will try to live as a Christian. That was really the height of it, but I waited to my cellmate was sleeping and I knelt down at the side of the bed and I, I just prayed and asked the Lord Jesus to save me. And, uh, you know, I was speaking in a university just a month ago and a girl said to me, but it could have been Allah changed your life or Buddha. I says, I don't believe that. You know why? I asked Jesus Christ yeah. to save me. And so my life was changed. I give him the glory for it. Mm -hmm. And I woke up the next morning, the very next morning, right? And usually you would just reach for your tobacco tin. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I opened my eyes, I says, I'm a Christian now. And what year was that? 1980. 1980. Mm -hmm, the 29th of January. And you start? Ah. Uh -huh. A new start bungalow shouted at me. Why are you smiling? Mm -hmm. I says, I've become a Christian now. Oh, he was so happy. He ran out the cell door. Hallelujah. Packy's joined the God Squad. Here comes Packy, the apostle. Oh, oh, it was terrible. I had to walk out onto the landing. And by the stage, six or seven guys are standing there outside my door looking at me. And one of them, who was my future brother-in-law, said to me, Oh, Packy, have you joined the God Squad? Mm -hmm. And I says, Yes, I've become a Christian. And then the guy beside him says, Are you a Christian? And I says, I am. Right, he says, I have a question for you. Who was Cain's wife? I says, Mrs. Cain. <laughs> what does that mean? I knew nothing about the Bible. I was reading the Bible for a year and I thought an epistle was the wife of an apostle. I thought Joan of Arc was married to Noah. I knew nothing about the Bible, but I'm going to tell you this, I felt different inside. You felt different? I really did, you know. How I, did you think? I felt just a joy. A joy. A joy. And, then, what do you hear this But I worked in the prison laundry at that time, so, and you came back then to the prison, you know, uh, for lunch, but you locked up and then you went down into the canteen. Well, I walked down into the canteen, there's 300 men sitting. And I walked over, picked up my tray, and as I walked over to the table to sit down, my brother-in-law was sitting over there and he smiled at me and I thought, this doesn't look good. And I set my tray down. Before I sat down, here is, quiet everyone, and he bangs the table. And here is, Packy asked me, can he pray before we eat? And I'd never prayed in my life. And, and they all started banging the tables. He says, who wants to hear him pray? But I just says, right, Oh, right, okay, okay. I had never prayed, but I've seen Christians pray on television. They all bow their head and hold, hold their nose like that. So I bowed my head and said a prayer, a short prayer. Mm. Opened my eyes and my sausages were gone. <laughs> the very next day, I kid you not, I came in, lifted my tray, walked over, and he thought he was being smart. Here is Packy. You going to pray? And I says, yes, can I? And I set the tray down, but I lifted my fork. And I says, thank you, God, for this food. If anyone touches it, they're dead. <laughs> and everybody laughed. But you know what? The whole jail knew. Because one side was loyalist and that side was Republican. Right. 
And then, do you know what happened? They all watched this, you see, and I turned around and there was an IRA man that I had had a fight with just a fortnight before and I'd stuck him into the big washing machine. But they're big washing machines, so it doesn't sound as bad as you think. But he was sitting there and I looked over then and I thought, I know what he's thinking. He's no Christian. Do you know what? I walked over to him and I says, listen, I'm sorry about that fight. Mm -hmm. And the poor guy was embarrassed then, you know, in front of everybody. And here he is. He says, don't talk to me. And that, that was it, you know. And I says, from now on, I'll be talking to everybody. But at the time, it was embarrassing. But I'm going to tell you, everybody knew yeah. that something had happened to me and that I was professing Christianity. And I'll tell you this, it was four years later, I was sitting out in the exercise yard, reading my New Testament, and this guy was walking around with his mate, the one who spit on me. And as we were walking past, he put a, a mint toffee sweet on top of my Bible. And I thought, what? And then they walked on, you see. And I thought, down in the maze, they were poisoning our dinner. And if you ate, yeah. And I thought, he's probably poisoned us. And then they were coming back round towards me, and the sweet was still sitting. But I thought, no, it says in Mark 16, you may eat any deadly thing. All right, okay. So I just says, Lord, I'm going to eat this. You better protect me. And I opened it, and just as they came round, the two of them stopped, and he laughed, you see. Wow. And then here he is to me, Paggy, you're genuine. Wow. And here's me, what? Here's, every time I see you, you're reading that Bible. And I says, do you know why, Sean? I knelt down in that cell and asked Jesus to change my life. And I says, he did, I know him. And here's, you know him. And he turned to his mate and says, I'd like to know Jesus like that with you. And he never answered the other guy. And he, he just went like that. And they carried on walking. But he, we were friends after that. Wonderful. And you know what? A year later, I had been in jail five and a half years and I was getting out on home parole for three days. I walked down the lawn and I had my big Bible with me in my hand and oh, most of the doors were closed but his was open. And I happened to look in and he was sitting on the bed and he smiled at me, so I knew I could walk into the cell. Usually you didn't do that. But because he smiled and all, I just stepped in. He says, I see you have your Bible, Packy. And he la I laughed too. And I says, no, I'm going home on parole this morning, Sean. This is my first time in six years. And then here's Packy. You really do know God. That's what he said to me. And I says, you're right. Do you know why? I knelt down, as I told you, in that cell, and God touched me. And but he got up off the bed and knelt down. Goodness. And there he is. Pray for me. Goodness. And I put my hand on him like this and prayed. And I says, you have to invite Jesus into your life, Sean. He says in Revelation, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man will open. And I says, You have to invite Christ into your life. Mm -hmm. And he says, I want to. And he prayed the sinner's prayer and asked for forgiveness. I got out in parole and brought him back a Bible. And there was a Thompson chain to it, it cost me a fortune. <laughs> If somebody had said to me I'd be buying a Bible for an IRA man, I wouldn't have believed him when I first came in. Mm -hmm. But that's what happened. My and there's, I'll say this then. I worked for prison fellowship when I came out of prison for five years and I was visiting a prison in East Belfast and when I went in, I was walking down the 
prison corridor and I was looking at the cells, looking for a particular prison, prisoner. And I looked at this card and I knew the surname was the same as Sean's. And I thought, I wonder if this boy is related to Sean. So I said to the screw, let me in. He opened the door and I walked in. And he, he, the boy turned around and he looked at me and he seen my, I had a Bible and all. And I says, listen, I used to be a prisoner up in Crumlin Road Jail and there was a prisoner there and I mentioned his name. I says, is there anything to you? And he laughed. He says, that's my older brother. And I says, is it really? I says, you know, I'm out of jail now, about five years. I says, tell me this, is he still a Christian? And here he is, Christian? Huh? He says he's doing a degree in theology. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's what he said to me. Oh. Well, I was so pleased then, you know. No, I got out of prison then shortly after that, you know. Mm. After I got that first parole, I was in my last year then, and then I got released uh, Christmas 1983. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and your family were pleased, obviously. Oh, well, I wrote a letter home to my mother, Patty, the, the, the night I got converted, and when I got out of prison, I, I actually read the letter, and I said to her, I have resurrection power living in me. Mm -hmm. Mom, Jesus has changed my life. And my mother just cried and says, God has answered my prayers. Okay. Answered the prayers of Granny Beggs, who said, I'll pray for your son. The old lady. The old lady. And I got to visit her. Oh, did you? I did indeed. And she says, I knew. She says, if God could change John Newton, a slave trader, he could change David too. Wow. Mm -hmm. Such faith. Such faith. Mm -hmm. It was hard when I first came out because uh, I had met a man in prison who was a prison visitor called James McElroy, mm -hmm. and they, he was involved in prison fellowship. Mm -hmm. And he asked me then would I get involved with him. But the thing was, because I had met guys in jail, Protestant and Catholic, I, I knew, for me, the religious thing of loyalist or Republican was not an issue anymore. It was, did a man know God or did he, did he not? And I met a Catholic guy who was on fire for God and loved God as much as me. So I got involved in prison fellowship, but that made it hard for me because when I was went to church, then the minister said to me, is it true you're speaking with the ex-IRA hunger striker? Going to church, is, is he a Catholic? And I says, yes, he is. And he says, is he a Christian? I says, he is. He says, I says, because a few years ago he would have shot me. Hmm. And now him and I are praying and doing Bible study. I says, he's certainly a Christian. And he says, no, you're charismatic. You're ecumenical. And he says, I don't want you in this church. And he asked me not to come back. And you know what? That happened to me another two times where I went to different churches. But the area I lived was loyalist area. You know what I mean? I had a friend in Derry who who had been a Catholic, who had been a, a, an official IRA man. But he told me it was difficult when he went back into the community because mm. they says, oh, you've turned prod, mm. you know? Mm. But it's hard explaining to people, you know, when you encounter God and the change that it's made in your life. Mm. But I realised anyway from this that I didn't question if, if somebody was a Catholic. I don't agree with all the, the doctrine of the Catholic Church, but I don't agree with all the doctrine in some of the Protestant Church. But I don't divide over mm. doctrine. I would just say I don't believe that or I believe something different. But I fellowship with people. What I'm saying is I met Catholics then. So when I got involved in PF, I started to go up to Clonard Monastery 
and visit even some of the nuns and all up there. And people were saying to me, you can't go up the Falls Road. If they find out you're up there, you're dead. I would go visit an IRA man. And people just says, you're off your head. But I did do that because I had no fear. Mm -hmm. And I had no fear. And I, some of my best friends are Roman Catholics that I met back at that time. And uh, I want to tell a story about Peter McCann. I was going down to Ross Trevor to the Christian Renewal Center. Mm -hmm. and. The secretary of prison fellowship was with me when we were, we just turned onto the motorway and there was a guy thumbing, hitching the lift. And I said to Mary, that was her name, Mary, get you in the back and let that guy in the front so I can get talking to him. So she jumped out and said to the guy, where are you going? I think he was going to Dublin or somewhere like that. But it, I knew he'd be in the car for a good while, but I had my sh jacket off and I was just wearing a t-shirt, you know, and I'm covered in tattoos and they were still political tattoos. I've had them all covered, you know, or lasered off or whatever, but at that time they were just the raw thing. Well, he, this guy stepped in, told me his name and all, and as we started driving then, I seen him glimpse and then he glimpsed again and then he was jerking his head around looking at my tattoos you see and I'm holding it and I thought oh dear me this guy would be thinking something else and I turned to him and I says listen just ignore them that means nothing I says you know that's my old life but I says would I tell you something God changed my life and as I talked to this guy, oh, uh, it, it was just incredible. He started saying, yes, but what, and asking all these questions. And I was saying, them, no, God can turn your life around and change it. And I just spoke, I think, hope to him. Because I could see there was a real, he was really listening to what I was saying, you know. And it was funny because he eventually told me he'd have to go a different direction. He says, just let me off here. And I says, do you mind if I pray for you? And he says, okay. So we pulled the car over and uh, we turned around. And I says, I'd, I'd like to put my hand on you when I'm praying and all. And he says, right, go ahead then. And then I bowed my head and he was juking with one eye watching me and I thought, oh, Catholics must pray like that with one eye open. And when he sat up then, he thanked me and all. And I said to him, you pray and ask God, God can change your life, Peter and all. And then I, I, I give him my New Testament. And I says, here, I want you to take it. Here's no, I'm not taking your Bible. Here's me, no, I want you to have it. You read that and you call. And I remember watching him walking away and he was flicking through, you know. And I sat there and I just said, oh, Lord, go ahead of this guy, you know. And uh, I have led other people to the Lord, but here was the thing then. I was sitting and work, and it must have been three months later, in prison fellowship in Belfast. And the door opened and this guy came bouncing up the stairs, big smile on his face. And he says, do you remember me? I says, yes, John. He says, no, Peter. Here's me, oh yes, from Derry. He says, no, Dublin. I was going, and it was him. All right, right. right. But the smile on his face, was remarkable. And then he said, what did I tell you? My wife, you know, was changed when I went home and told her and showed her the Bible and all. And he says, it's turned our whole lives around. And I thought, my goodness. But the joy on his face, I knew he'd got something that was real. Yeah. But God went ahead of him and took over, intervened in this family and restored and everything else. And 
I found the guy to be such an encouragement. I, I thought, we need to get this guy in the work here, get him working with guys. So he's been in, himself then. Peter was involved, you know, in the work of PF and working with guys and then with Divine Healing Ministries as well. But he's a man I've always <laughs> loved just being in his presence because of that joy. So he's only one of so many that I've seen. Yeah. But I was making a, a documentary for Dutch television. And uh, they said, you know, is there others that you could think of that you could say, mm. did you influence them? Mm. And I says, I thought of Peter McCann. I says, yes, but he, he lives quite a distance away. And he says, no, get him up, we'll cover all his expenses and all. So I rang him and he came up and it was so funny because when he, he was doing the talk then, he said that he was the prod who led me to God. You know, and I, I thought, I don't like that term prod, but he's the one that used it. And it was amazing because a long time afterwards, I went down to Dublin to speak in a meeting and I did not know this but the Ardash was being held there. Right? And I looked out the window and I seen all these IRA men and I thought I knew him. Oh, I know him too. And then I realised this is some Republican. Mm. Why is there so many IRA men? And you know what? You're not going to believe this. There was a newspaper that day, mm -hmm. that very day, right? I'm upstairs in the room thinking, what should I do here? Should I try walk out amongst all these things or what? And the guy with me says, we need to get security. And I'm saying, no, wait. I flexed the newspaper open. I got the shock of my life. The double pages. I kid you not, right across, what did it say? The prod who led me to God. And there's my photo stuck in the middle of it. And I thought, oh, I'll get killed here if any of these have read this yeah, paper. paper. Yeah, yes, yeah. I kid you not, I thought, if any of them have been reading that paper, do you know who read it? Martin McGuinness. All right. Yes. yes, and he says, I want to meet Packy Hamilton. All right. And I says, that Peter McCann's going to get me killed, you know, because of this. But it was a big double spread, you know. And I walked out of that place, and it's just the way that it happened. The car pulled up, and the guy stepped out of it, and he was the IRA commander in the H blocks. And he looked at me, and I thought, thought he, I think he recognises me, because everybody knew me because it was bold, you know, about being a Christian and all. And I said, you know what, he was in the H blocks with you. And I shook his hand and he shook my hand. And you know what, I was amazed because he said to me, you know, because you were a UVF man, he says, I just think you're a misguided Irish man. You know, and laugh, but I walked away and I heard him saying, that was a UVF man. The other guy was saying, what, what? <laughs> and they are Dutch, you know, but it was funny, and Peter and I, our lives just entwined, you know, mm. from then on. And it's those kind of stories that just thrill your heart. Yeah. You know, it is, and I've never looked back from this day to this. Never looked back, you know. You haven't been very well, um, you know, for, for a while. You know, I've had a baptism of suffering. It started when, you know, I had my leg off five years ago and then a couple of heart attacks and then I had a pacemaker put in and then uh, just 18 months ago I was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer in my face and uh, I had surgery and that but I didn't take radiotherapy or nothing like that I just says no I believe God can heal me without chemotherapy and then I took a heart attack a couple of months after that and to put a pacemaker in. And then I had another heart attack, what, five days ago? Five days ago. You know, but it slowed me down to a gallop, you know. Mm -hmm. That's all. But it hasn't affected your faith? Oh, 
I said to my mother in Cookstown when the heart attack, this is that exciting, Mum. I could get buried up the road. <laughs> but she says, don't be talking like that, you know. Mm. But mm. no, when you have Christ in your life and you know the reality of God, there's no fear of dying. Mm. You know, no fear of that whatsoever. Mm. So just plod on. Plod on. But I want to say this, this last couple of days being here has been wonderful. Yeah. Really wonderful. Such a blessing for us. Mm -hmm. And just to hear all the stories and relive it all and yeah. see how your family have grown up and all. Mm -hmm. And ah, it's just the blessings of God. Yeah, of course. The blessings mm -hmm. of all what would you say to somebody who hasn't found God yet? I have found just in everyday life you come across people who think they're in control. or And you don't have to talk people long to you find out what their God is. Or to just live and say, listen, I've met, oh, money's my God. and Or women's my God, and people find, people have to find something to worship. And if it's not God, they'll find it from something else. You know, it's just, the Bible says in John 1 verse 4, in Him was life, or is life, and that is the life of God. Jesus says, whoever follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And when you come into a knowledge of God, then you see things so different, altogether different, that you find joy and peace, not in materialism, not in money, no, but in God. And so when people, I would just say to them, try God. Ask God to reveal himself to you. And you'll find, you know, Jesus says, a man's life is not found in the abundance of possessions. Life is in the sun, the Bible says. And it says, he that has the sun has life. And then Jesus says in John 10, 10, not just life, but an abundant. That's what it says, but an abundant life. And when you see that and God working and watching, and I know, I woke up in the hospital and the nurse says, me lie down, you've had an accident. I says, I have not. I have no accident. There's no accidents in my life. God's in control of my life. And that's the joy that the Lord makes. If somebody hasn't found God, I would say, the Bible says that if you reach out and you seek him, but you have to want to know him, God will not do it against your will. No, he won't. But if you open the door and invite him in, then you will experience for yourself the reality of God. And so many have found that. And I thank God over the years I've met people who have visited even in jail and got a hold of God and have met them 40 years later. But their lives have been changed. So at the beginning, whenever you were starting to read the Bible, you know, how did you go about that? How did you know where to, to read, you know, and what to do? You know, what was it uh, or, or who, who actually advised you and how to do that? Yes, people would say to me, well, how do you know when you say, oh, God said this or God spoke to you? What I realised was, even from the word go, the Spirit of God comes to live within a believer. And Jesus says in John 8, My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Well, at the start, I didn't know it was God. If you had said to me that night in my cell, or oh, David, was that God saying he kept you alive? I didn't know it was God. It could have been downtown radio for all I knew. Because God's voice can only be discerned by the Spirit. We have a spirit, we're spirit, soul and body. And God quickens your spirit and your spirit makes you God conscious, not with your mind or the soul, but the spirit. And so God, you learn to recognize God when you start to read the Bible. And 
as I said, I was reading it, but you know, there was a moment in time where I was reading my Bible one day and it was Acts 26 and 16. It says, Arise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness of the things that thou have seen and the things that thou shalt see hereafter. I'm sending you as light to the Gentiles to turn many from darkness into light that they may be sanctified. And I read this whole passage but something strange said to me, that is for you. And I looked at it again and it says that you'll become a minister and a witness. And I thought, well, I can be a witness. Okay, that's not a... What does that mean, a minister? Does that mean like a dog collar and all dressed up like Batman? But you know what? That was a call in my life. Mm. I got out of prison. I was ordained then as a minister. And... I've been a witness for God for 40 years. And if somebody was just, you know, watching this at some point and, and they were thinking about, you know, well, maybe I should look at the Bible or maybe I should try and read it. Have you any suggestions around that? I would, yes. I would say read one of the Gospels mm -hmm. because the Gospels will point you to Jesus Christ, you know. Because, you know, God says to Paul the Apostle, and when he's writing in his Ephesians, he says this, I pray that you may know, and here's what he says, that God may give you enlightenment. Mm -hmm. That's revelation. And you know what it says? Of a knowledge of his Son. God doesn't teach you doctrine. None of that. He reveals his son mm -hmm. that you fall in love with him more and more. John's gospel is written and John said that this is because he was God's son. Mm -hmm. And it's to reveal him as the son of God. And the more that you read that, I have found this, the more that you read the Bible and love the Lord. You know this, we spoke, spoke to him on there over a hundred years year old today, this morning. And what just came out of him? The scriptures, the word of God. And it's all about Jesus. Mm. And it's, that's what it is. It's Christocentric. When you get a hold of him. Mm. It's getting to know Jesus. Oh, it is. And it'll take a lifetime. Yeah, And to know he loves you. Oh, well, you, that'll soon blow your socks off because you don't... God makes you realize that you're special. Yeah, and he'll always love ah. John the Elder, who was John the Apostle, who wrote Revelation, and his last days, he was an old man living at Ephesus, apparently with the Virgin Mary. Mary went to live with him in Ephesus and that. But you know what? He would say to him, what have you want to say to the church? His message was all the same, love one another, love one another, because God is love. Mm -hmm.